Well, many years ago, my family and I used to listen to a song called I Can Only Imagine by Mercy Me on the Christian Radio. And most recently, that song came to mind. And um, after listening to the lyrics, one particular stanza gripped me, and it went like this. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine, I can only imagine. And today's chapter of With Reverence and Awe uh, tries to answer this question. Returning to the basics of Reformed worship, today's chapter is uh, Worship and Godly Fear. Um, if you're new to the channel for the first time, welcome. My name is Tim. So happy you've joined us. And uh, we're going through a chapter by chapter summary of this book. And today we're talking about worship and godly fear. So the chapter essentially opens by talking about reviewing the two principles or some of the two principles that we've discussed so far. The first one is the regulative principle of worship, namely that God regulates what we are to do in worship. And the second one is the dialogical principle. That principle essentially says that there is a dialogue happening in worship because of the Bible's covenantal structure. And um, so there are parties in that dialogue when we come to worship. One of the parties is the people of God, and the other parties is God. And uh, that, that second party is essentially represented by the minister who preaches the word and speaks on behalf of God. These two principles also have something to say about the tone and mood of worship. This is also known as the how of worship. Acceptable worship is to be conducted in a reverent fashion. And my own side note, when we say reverent, we're not talking about slavish fear, but we're talking about childlike humility and respect of our Father. So there is joy intermingled and perfectly balanced as we come before God and before the throne of grace with great confidence. Essentially, when we come before God, it is a dialogue that displays awe and godly fear. To conduct the worship service with carelessness is to offer worship that is displeasing to God. Because essentially we're saying, or we're treating or behaving ourselves as if God is something that He is not. The Bible says that God is a consuming fire. And so when we enter before God carelessly or irreverently, we're saying, this doesn't matter, or you aren't as holy as you uh, declare yourself to be in your word. Our irreverent age, when we look at movies, when we look at social media, when we look outside in the public, um, borrows frequently from the likes of Hollywood, which has cultivated such informality that it had rendered any notion of reverence increasingly remote. For this reason, much of today's worship is oriented around entertainment. Pastors are pressured to conduct a service that pleases the people in the pew. The fear being that people in the pew will leave boring styles of worship for the church across the street with better music or better skits. Sermons, for instance, are becoming messages geared towards felt needs than driving home the needs that the Bible says fallen men and women have. Irreverent worship is a violation of God's holy style, God desires reverent worship that reflects the seriousness that is inherent in a religion that required the death of his only son in order to redeem his people from the bonds of sin. To help define what the scripture teaches regarding reverence, it's helpful to define what it is not. Dignity in worship is not achieved through elaborate ceremonies or complex liturgies. That would be to say that God looks at the outward appearance and that we are essentially trying to uh, create an outward appearance of reverence. We are not. The Bible says that God looks at the heart. And essentially, Reformed theology is trying to say, listen, we are to approach God with a reverent heart above all, regardless of liturgy, regardless of the lighting in the church, whether that's gloomy or whether that's bright. Um, so, right, throwing off fancy liturgies that try to 
you know, spell an external uh, reverence. Instead, reverence ought to be paired with simplicity. Reverence is neither an argument for elitism. It is just as irreverent to put a symphony orchestra at the front of a church as a rock and roll band uh, on the stage. Such displays connote an atmosphere of entertaining the audience instead of concentrating on God and His Word. Reverence, importantly, does not exclude joy. Joy, along with the full range of emotions such as grief, anger, desire, hope, fear, and love, should find natural outlets in worship. However, we ought not to drum up our emotions, but our emotions ought to be the result or the byproduct of the truth that God speaks to us. And that ought to stir our emotions. So there, there is a sequence that we ought not to put the, the cart before the horse. However, Reverend says that emotions should be tempered by moderation, self-control, and respect for who God is and who we are before Him. Simply put, reverent worship is the necessary application of Reformed theology. The doctrine of God and His holiness and justice, the doctrine of man and His depravity, and the doctrine of Christ and His sacrificial work on the cross should prompt Christians to come into God's presence with holy fear. Excuse me, consider the prophet Isaiah's response to God's presence. Quote, Woe is me, for I am lost. Isaiah 6, verse 5. Here, Isaiah is not adopting a casual pose in a comfortable setting. Moreover, Isaiah's example is not simply a function of Old Testament worship. Revelation also describes reverent worship when the presence of the Lamb, the elders, when in the presence of the Lamb, the elders fall down before Him who is seated on the throne and worship Him. They cast their crowns before the throne. Revelation 4 verse 10. So the entire Old Testament sacrificial system served to prefigure the fulfillment of God's purposes, which is only Christ. The only Redeemer of God's elect fulfilled Israel's rituals. The church has the perfected sacrifice, and that sacrifice provides a better way to worship God. The New Testament proclaims a radical transformation in worship, thanks to the saving work of Christ. Christ transforms the cowering fear of God in Leviticus into bold access. And yet, because God does not change and God remains the holy, holy, holy God of the Bible, of the Old Testament, we ought to maintain that same spirit and, and reverence when we come before God. Paul writes that through faith in Christ, quote, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 12. Similarly, this idea is further echoed in the letter to the Hebrews when it says, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 19. Thus, we can do what the Old Testament saints could not do, approach God with boldness and confidence only through the blood of Christ. However, since Leviticus provides the theological categories for understanding Christ's priesthood and for our worship through him, the principle of worship revealed in Leviticus is still instructive for understanding the manner in which Christians approach God in public worship. Following the example of Marcion, or Marcion, a second century heretic who maintained a radical difference between the God of the Jews who was vengeful and wrathful and the Father of Jesus, a God of grace and mercy. Many today believe that New Testament worship is no longer formal or strict or regulated. The church needs to be informal, spontaneous, and user-friendly, words that hardly fit the image of Leviticus. Yes, we draw near to the Father with full assurance of faith. This assurance drives out all bondage and fear, but it should not promote indifference, casualness, or presumption. 
Reformed catechisms discourage our imagining that, when coming to the Father with reverence and confidence, we must balance delicately two seemingly contradictory sentiments, tight roping between two extremes. The canons of Dort link reverence and joy as complementary and mutually reinforcing, not antagonistic characteristics. Reverent worship is not as effective Sorry, reverent worship is not an effective way of persuading the world that Christians can have a good time. So seeker-sensitive worship replaced a consuming fire with an affirming and empowering God. One who accepts whatever we do. By practicing reverent worship, Christian worship can subvert our culture with the truth that God comes to us only on his terms and never on ours. His terms are the sacrifice of Christ. God accepts our worship because as a consuming fire, he has consumed the sacrifice on our behalf. And so, therefore, we come before God with confidence, not because of our reverence, not because of our spontaneity, but actually because of the sacrifice of Christ. Our confidence is in Jesus Christ, and so we come to worship God our Redeemer because of, through Christ, our Mediator. And we'll end in conclusion on um, Revelation chapter 5, starting at verse 8. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching. Lord willing, we'll see you next time. God bless you.